going to start with a small medical. <coughs> Heart attacks are the leading cause of death in the United States and many other countries. And over the years, a number of medications have been developed that lower the risk of heart attacks by more than half. And this is one of the greatest successes in medicine over the last several decades. Lots of careful young clinical trials. The evidence is really unambiguous. So I'm going to ask this august group of people, what percentage of insured patients in the United States are hospitalized with a heart attack take the recommended cardiac medications over the course of the following year? Can I ask for a show of hands? Who thinks it's 85 to 100 percent? No, no optimists in this room? Yeah. OK. 70 to 84? 55 to 69? OK. 40 to 54? Below 40. Interesting. OK, so I would guesstimate about 20% of you said below 40, maybe 70%, 40 to 54, and 10%, 55 to 69, with nobody thinking it's above 70%. All right, so now imagine that we made all these medications free. I'm going to ask you the same question. What percentage of people do you think take all the recommended medications the year after being hospitalized with a heart attack? Show of hands, 85 to 100 percent. 70 to 84. Okay, 55 to 69. 40 to 54. Below 40. All right. So appropriately, we see a bit of a shift in the distribution, uh, but nobody picked 85 to 100 percent, which it turns out is correct. Now, what's sobering is, and this is the data from a study that our colleague at Harvard H. Hughes Chowdhury led, where he got Aetna to randomize all their patients hospitalized in the US with heart attacks uh, to either getting their cardiovascular medicines for free or paying usual price. And there are two numbers you see on this slide, both of which I think are both striking and sobering. Uh, if you have standard copayments, you have average adherence 39%, making the medications free helped a little bit, raising that average to 45%. So the reason I'm showing you this is to highlight that medication adherence is a tough problem. Uh, if we can't get people in the throes of a life-threatening event like a heart attack to take their medicines in the following year, then many other contexts where we're trying to get patients to take their medicines like control of blood pressure before you've had a heart attack or a stroke are, are obviously very hard. And there are a lot of things that researchers have tried. Uh, here's a study that looked at simple kinds of reminders, you know, various electronic gizmos that, that record when you take your medicines or show you which medicines you've taken when you take your medicine each day or even the ubiquitous plastic pill box. And the numbers on this slide, I think, also unfortunately highlight for chronic disease maintenance, adherence numbers are very low. And this is, in essence, the percentage of people who have adherence above 80%. And you can see none of these devices have any impact. And the percentages who have above 80% adherence are tiny, 15%. Uh, and for doses that are more than once a day, it's, it's even slightly worse, maybe 12%. This is a big study that our group did that was a spectacularly negative study. We got uh, five insurance companies to partner with us, and all the patients they were discharging from a hospital with heart attacks, we offered them the opportunity to participate in this intervention, which they got daily incentives. They had wireless pill bottles. We connected them with social supporters, so a friend or family member who would automatically get notified if they missed two doses of any medicine. Uh, and basically, you can see without any statistical tests that this did not have any effect in reducing the admissions. And this followed, we had done a number of smaller scale studies using incentives that were quite expensive, were quite effective and expensive. But what was striking to us once we realized, once we automated a lot of what we were doing with the technology uh, platform, a lot of those effects in essence dissipated 
that if we had an inadvertent confound when this was done manually of people being socially accountable and wanting to do well with the person who they enrolled in the study, who they had personal contact with, they knew that person would know if they were adherent. Just a question. These are readmissions. Do, do we know what, does that just mean the drugs don't work? I assume not. I think that's probably uh, not the explanation. Have, it is a possible explanation, but, but, but know, based on the clinical trials of the drugs themselves, I would say the answer is no. But you, you know how often they take the pills, right? We know how often they open the pill bottles. And we've done other tests which suggest that that concords pretty well <laughs> in studies where, for example, you want measure people's cholesterol and you can see a pretty good concordance between taking the pill and what happens with your cholesterol. So would you guess that taking the pill slot graphs would look the same? No, we would have expected, we expected the, the intervention to have a pretty big effect on adherence and then thought it was a question of how much of an effect would that have on reducing readmissions. So it was, but we don't have adherence data comparing the intervention group and the control group in this study because we set it up as a pragmatic trial where the control group was just usual care. Uh, 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 right. So you're discharged from the hospital, <laughs> uh, we have your medical records, but we have no contact with you. We don't know if you take your pills and how often. So here's some reasons this study may not have worked. We had a little bit of this self-selection problem, which is perhaps analogous to the gin studies that Katie showed. 7% of those who were offered the opportunity of joining this initiative joined, uh, and maybe they're the most motivated people. So we're comparing our effect with the 7% of people who were highly motivated. This was designed to be a health plan-based model, so we had no direct uh, engagement with any of the clinicians. Maybe that type of model uh, is, is inherently less effective. There's also a delay in terms of how quickly the insurance companies could get us the data that would confirm somebody actually was discharged from the hospital with a heart attack. It was 41 days on average between when somebody was discharged and when we could enroll them. We did find that a lot of people were actually already readmitted in that 41 days. And in our, I, what I just showed you was our pre-specified analyses. In exploratory analyses, we found out that those who had already been readmitted, readmit our intervention actually worked pretty well. But so there may be something there uh, where if you could do this kind of initiative and you can enroll people right when they left the hospital, you might have had more of an effect than what we observed. There's also, there's issues with the technology, the electronic pill bottles. I think they've gotten better over time, but this study was started uh, about five years ago, and initially we had a number of challenges with some of the, the technology. Now let me show you some things that have worked, so you don't totally despair. This was a study that was led by my colleague Peter Reese, who's a transplant uh, physician, and he had this very interesting idea of just making in essence, using social accountability so that the provider would get a report on your daily adherence uh, if you were a former transplant patient. And you can see here, relative to the control, which also had these electronic pill bottles that were monitoring daily adherence, giving reminders, uh, which is blue, red is reminder and provider notification, you see a pretty big bump here in terms of measured adherence. Now, one of the challenges, coming back to Richard's question, is what does this tell us about whether people are actually taking the medication? And in this study, uh, one of the things that was concerning is we measured cyclosporin levels, which was the immunosuppressant people were taking, and we did not see differences that concorded with differences in adherence of this magnitude. So some of this might reflect people in the control group using their medication less often as opposed to people in the intervention group using their medication more often. So that's, that's just a caveat. But at least some potential promise here uh, for this kind of low-cost approach. Here's a study Judd Kessler led, uh, where this was done among CES members, and in essence was looking at the notion of providing social support uh, and smart reminders. So what's different from the 
the reminder study I showed you early on with these low tech interventions was these were just triggered when people were actually not adherent. Uh, and in essence, what we tested was a control group, a reminder group, assigning somebody a social support partner who they would volunteer, who would get information about their adherence, or their combination of reminders and, and partners. And what you observe here, and what the statistical tests show, is in essence all of the interventions were effective relative to this control. But having this social support partner was actually no more effective than just the active reminder itself. Uh, part of the issue here was we, we analyzed this, of course, as an intent to treat analysis, and only 80% of participants in the partner arm, 56% of participants in the partner uh, reminder arm, actually signed up somebody to be the social supporter. So that, of course, uh, diminished the effectiveness of that approach quite a bit. There also are a number of system level approaches that work quite well. And I think a lot of these perhaps have the most promise because they relate to um, something that we, we've all heard Danny say a number of times about lowering friction in, in the system, lowering barriers, making it easier for people to be adherent. So this is an example of a study that Joel Padoshi led where we got Humana to synchronize prescriptions. And this all probably uh, would surprise you that Typically, prescriptions are not synchronized. So if you're on 10 or 12 medications and you have 10 or 12 different refill dates, it's a pretty complex organizational task to remember when all these medicines are due. So synchronizing them in people who have low adherence actually led to about a 13 percentage point increase in adherence, which is a pretty large effect. Another approach, which uh, George Lowenstein and Poonam Peller and Barry Harlem were involved in developing, is just automating the refill process. So again, if you're on a lot of medications, just send you the medications automatically. Uh, and what this graph shows is initially when CVS had set this up, it was set up as an opt-in type system. Enrollment rates weren't that high. Uh, we developed with them an enhanced active choice approach where we basically just made it more salient to people, the convenience of having these refills come to you automatically versus having to do it yourself. Uh, roughly this doubled the rate at which people sign up for the program. And CBS now uses this as the on-ramp for a lot of their uh, patients. And so it's just an example of making it easier for people who want to be adherent to be adherent. Another approach, uh, this is work that David Ash and I co-led, is looking at a combination of patient and provider incentives. A lot of times we look at one or the other uh, in essence, what we see in this graph is changes in LDL cholesterol. And the one group where you see both intensification of therapy by the providers and improvements in adherence by the patients is the group that's getting half of the incentive to the patient and half to the provider. Uh, neither the patient or provider incentive by itself had a significant effect on cholesterol. So in other words, I think what we've seen uh, is that there's a lot of work to do in this space. We have some promising uh, system type approaches, but in terms of individually targeted interventions, I'd say uh, so far we have not achieved nearly the kind of success uh, that the public health community would love to see. And this is where we're hoping a lot of you might be interested in getting engaged. Uh, we are in discussions with the two largest pharmacy benefits managers in the country, each of them have about 70 million members, were optimistic that one of them will agree to do this. But the basic idea uh, is to build a science-based program to encourage greater medication adherence among customers of this PBM. We want to try to address some of these issues we've alluded to both earlier and just now about self-selection into these programs by a small percentage of people by doing a variety of tests, some which would involve participants opting in for higher touch, perhaps more expensive interventions, and then for most of the interventions using more of an opt-out approach, which would really test effectiveness in, in practice. Uh, we would then get data from the PBM throughout this year, next year, and then, of course, we would analyze data and share learnings about uh, everything we can. We have developed a, a platform under uh, Mohan Balachandran's leadership at our center uh, that in essence automates a lot of the testing of behavioral interventions and we'd encourage anyone who's interested more broadly 
uh, to use this platform. It's called Penway to Health. The basic idea is we take inputs from a variety of different kinds of devices. They transmit information to our server. We push that back out to people by text, by email, by interactive voice recording. This can be uh, social, it can be individual. We can transfer funds electronically to participants. And we've done this in a lot of different types of scenarios now, different incentive models, clinical conditions, device integrations, biomedical measures. So it's a pretty robust set of functionalities that have been built that we plan to use as part of this new medication adherence initiative. So let me stop there and happy to take questions. And I, I should also uh, mention that I've been working on co-developing this with Katie, with Jalpa, and with David Ash. And we hope to have as many of you as possible involved. Caremark at the University of Chicago, so I'm somewhat familiar with that interface, which is not as friendly as you might like. Uh, so I have never had a heart attack, thankfully, um, and I keep a doctor with me at all times. But um, as far as I can tell, they handle all drugs pretty much the same. So I wonder whether if you are taking one of these heart medicine drugs after a heart attack, they could be more aggressive. And even if you have automatic renewal, when the prescription runs out, the, their process of contacting the doctor sometimes breaks down and periodically you have to bug them and so yeah it, it, it there's more sludge to be cleaned out of that system yeah i think that's a, that's a good point the numbers we've seen suggest that the way they look at non-adherence is, is really just looking at the numbers and the averages in all these different categories and not necessarily tying it to the relative value in one clinical context versus another. So it's an interesting thought that there might be some useful differentiating efforts that could be made in, in some of these more higher value clinical contexts than, than others. Max? So I think I'm using the same method as, uh, as, as Richard. From the thinking about, about my own culture procedure, and, and you kind of make me nervous. And like, do I take it at the right time? Am I thinking about the interactions, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And, and it, it seems to me that whenever there's a prompt, the prompt could do more things. Um, for example, the first 30 days of the prescription. Is there any reason that you can't accept kind of like an appointment so that I know that at, either in the morning or night of is there a reason why we're not at that level of putting it on people's schedule so that it becomes part of the habit that the habit people in the prior session were talking about? I don't know that there's a reason other than that, that no one thought to do that, uh, but that seems like a good idea to test. One of the things that has struck me over the years is that a lot of the entities in the system that have been in charge of this, namely the health plans and the pharmacy benefits managers, they've sort of consigned themselves to this descending uh, trend in adherence after an acute event that everyone, I don't want to say finds acceptable, but, but doesn't get outraged about. And it's an interesting question, like why do you accept this voltage drop of 15% as soon as people walk, leave the hospital in terms of who fills the initial medication and then who refills the medication the first time, and so on and so forth. So it'd be good to really think about what could be done right at the beginning to try to change the trajectory. Um, let me go to Islet and then Wendy, uh, and then Adam. Okay. So for me to think about solution, I think I need to have a better understanding of why people don't want here, when I can see at least two very different reasons. Okay, One is that they go into just half dosage, which 
it saves money, okay? So maybe I can, instead of taking the two pills, I can just take one pill and it will last longer, in which case we might go into another chronic evolve call, you know, and visualization is not going to work. The other way is that we they forget, in which case we might go into this is the answer. There's a third one, which is side effects. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, so that, that, and it could be more. Do we sure. know why? There, there are a lot of reasons, and I think it depends a lot on the clinical context, the side effect profile, the cost of the medication, the type of patient, uh, their own self-image. And that's one of the challenges is that a lot of people have tried to come up with sort of one-size-fits-all approaches that do not reflect the variety of reasons why people aren't taking the medication. So we should talk more about that. Uh, let's go to Wendy and then Adam. Yeah, so um, I'm only aware of a couple of, this is sort of the, the alternate um, perspective from Tyler. Um, I'm only aware of a couple of studies that have actually observed what people do who are successful at taking their medication. And it seems to me that that could be mine much more because two questions about the, the question you posed to us at the beginning. The first one is, what does it say about a room of behavioral scientists that most of us did not vote for the option with the widest statistical distribution? We know the answer. <laughs> one of you. Uh, the second one, more serious, is uh, what happens when you give patients this information? So I think on the one hand, uh, Bob and Noah would warn us that it's a bad idea because it would, uh, it would fight social proof and suggest that a lot of people aren't taking their meds. On the other hand, I think there's a mental contrasting story to be told that says, hey, wait a minute, you know, I immediately can anticipate barriers once I see there are a lot of people aren't doing it, and then form implementation intentions to overcome it. Um, do we have any evidence about either of those? Not, not that I'm aware of. I, I would worry that the social norming around low adherence would be a more powerful effect, but I, I don't know, and I, I haven't seen anyone do that, do that study. You could warn them of the increased risk don't, without telling yeah. you how common it is. Yeah. Let's go. Uh, so it, there, it's not intentional. It, it, the issue is not forgetting, and it's not intentional in the sense that they're trying to avoid side effects. I mean, could it be that actually, you know, being a heart, being post heart attack is like a spoiled identity? And that taking your medication is simply a reminder that you are a sick person. Oh yeah, I think for a lot of people, especially in the context of an acute event like that, where you start feeling better, uh, th those issues about self-identity become very important. But, but I want to be clear, I think for a lot of people it, it is about side effects or it is about perceived side effects. And for some people it also is about financial barriers. The, the example I showed you with the Aetna data, 39% versus 45%, would suggest that at least for those medications, now that a lot of generics are available, financial barriers aren't the main driver, but certainly for some other medications, that's a huge 
a huge impact. Again, I think you would provide President Clinton stopping his statin because he thought he was just dumb. That would be in that category of someone who's smart but who's psychologically just trying to repress the idea he might have something wrong with him. I mean, that was. Wait, is that true? It's true. Yeah. And he stopped taking statins because he said, oh, I thought I was dumb. I thought it was better. It was like an antibiotic. After his bypass. Take it, you're done. Yeah. yeah. He's like a reasonably well educated, smart guy. <laughs> <laughs> I really care. Yeah, yeah. I think that's not uncommon. It's very all right, well, hopefully in the next six weeks, <laughs> yeah. um, we'll have some positive news about agreement with one of the PBMs to proceed. Uh, and we've actually already put together what the RFAs might look like for opt-in versus opt-out studies. And as soon as we have a solid agreement, we look forward to sharing them with you and getting as many wonderful ideas as possible on the table. We'd love to do uh, a whole set of these studies and see if collectively we can really make some serious progress. Yeah, and I just wanted to add to uh, Kevin's wonderful presentation, especially given so many questions from, there's lots of us, myself included in the room, who aren't experts on medication adherence, who are excited about working on it. Not only will you get a short request for proposal sort of explaining these are the, play, this is the playground, these are the parameters you can play with in your RCT, um, we will also hold some like info sessions, webinars, where you can come online and we'll also provide material just to get you up to speed on these things. What are the, you know, what are the common barriers? Which are the different um, medications we're gonna be studying? It'll be things like uh, ranging from asthma and diabetes medication to breast cancer medication. And obviously, I yell it to your point, like there might be different barriers for those different conditions. And you'll be able to choose, I wanna, do an RCT with everybody because I think I have a general solution or I'd like to target people with asthma because I actually only think what I've come up with works for people in this category or who have this barrier or age group. You could, so you'll have choice. And for those uh, who haven't worked in the med adherence space, we, you know, we'd be willing to share resources on what has worked in the past versus not share articles and other things as well. Yeah. So we're excited about this. Yay. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs>
similar thanks Katie hi everyone um, so yeah I um, I heard about this actually via I think a Foodnomics podcast that came out probably your initial meeting uh, so remembering hearing that I was like I haven't got this job I wanted to absolutely come here and just learn and I've already taken away loads of key insights that I'll take back to our charity um, but the reason this is a bit further out is because we're not very far in so I'm about three months into my role we launched this charity in October uh, it's a new charity. Um, it was the brainchild of uh, TV chef Jamie Oliver. Um, over in the UK, he's been campaigning about um, school dinners and food for the last 20 years. And he felt we're really going to crack child obesity over the next 10, and it's got to be about an alliance and bringing more people to the table to really try and address it. So our mission is to halve child obesity by 2030, um, and also to reduce the inequalities um, in at least between rich, uh, rich and poor. We're going to do three things. Um, we're fortunate that there's a lot of activity happening in the UK already with top-down government regulation on sugary drinks, taxes, and a whole bunch of other uh, regulatory measures that are in the pipeline. So we're going to do three things. The first is we want to bring the consumer to the table. We want to uh, appeal to children and their parents and really make uh, build a movement that is going to start to get the consumer to buy back at the food industry and get them to change their behaviour. So that's part one. The second thing we're going to do is try and, through this alliance, build a load of local actors. Uh, so it could be school principals, it could be chief executives of local authorities, who directly improve the food uh, environment for our children. So, so you make the default choice, the healthy choice becomes the easy choice. That's, that's the bit at local level we want to drive. And then the third thing is to actually measure and learn, because at the moment we don't know what does work. Um, I'm hoping that the you know, second round of trials are going to be more successful than the first. Uh, and they'll, de they'll definitely work this time. But, uh, but you know, the, the real thing is we're, we're going into the unknown. We're going to learn a lot as we go along. So how can we actually test, evaluate, and learn as we go along? And this mega trial, when sort of I was looking around the world at you know, what are the most impactful things we could look at, this partnership and uh, doing this felt like uh, definitely one of, the, one of the most impactful things. So really delighted to be here and to be working with all of you. Thank you. Um, well, we're really excited about about this partnership um, and really delighted that you're here, James. So people can grab James at the reception and, and ask him questions if you want. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the playground we're building in this for this mega study. So this is not gonna launch for over a year, so this is a very early preview. But the plan is that uh, interventions in this space are gonna be six months, no more 28 day interventions. Maybe we learned our lesson or maybe we're just you know kidding ourselves. But we're gonna try six month interventions in this uh, in this space. Um, we're gonna we're planning to enroll 24,000 parents. So rather than directly talking to the kids about their eating habits, we're gonna enroll parents, and then kids will be part of those interventions, but through the parents. Uh, the the plan is for children aged four to eleven to be part of the mega study, and we're thinking about about 12 experimental conditions based on the population we'll be recruiting from. Uh, and this would give us a lot of power to actually detect fairly small effects. And, and that's okay, we're, we're okay with small effects. We, we recognize that's probably what we're best at. There are gonna be low cost interventions again. So we hope to have, uh, we plan to do more with social um, and we'll have physical mailings and phone calls as part of these interventions. So the outcome we'll be measuring is BMI at the end of the intervention. A really interesting thing about the UK is they actually measure kids BMI in school. So we're gonna be able to get that measure both at the end of our intervention period and before our intervention period as a control, which really gives us, again, a lot of statistical power to look at this. Um, and, and these six-month-long interventions, are gonna, we're going to use the Way to Health platform that Kevin just talked about for these. They'll include mailings, so physical mailings that we can send to parents and homes. Get, you can get creative with that. Uh, phone calls, including phone calls with nutritionists. Um, incentives, interactive text messages and emails. And if you come up with another mode, let us know. We actually also talked about doing a few of the trials in schools with cafeterias. So that's another option that probably won't be part of the mega study, but rather something we do in parallel in partnership because we'll be recruiting through about a thousand schools, if I'm remembering the numbers correctly, and that, that's a chance to, to do RCTs with the cafeterias. So we're really excited about this. Um, let me just say we have a lot to learn to become you know, really ready to launch this, and Angela and I are not experts on this. Uh, but happily, there are experts on our team. Not all of them are here today, but we have folks like Gary Foster, who's the Chief Scientific Officer of Weight Watchers, um, Kevin, Tom Wadden, who are, are part of this team, who are going to get us smarter about all this. And again, we'll have info sessions and, and try to make sure that you guys know the key things 
that have already been learned that are, are uh, big insights and also what some of the key barriers are. Um, just a couple of, of high level takeaways, this is very high level, um, but a little bit of good news, you know, Kevin's work with Leslie John, number 13 member and others, I don't know if there's others in the room around this study, uh, George, George is another person everybody in this room knows, uh, not Mike Thornton, a different one. This is a great study that they did that Angela and I taught in our behavior change classes. We love it so much. Uh, so Kevin, thank you for sharing this slide. They did some work with deposit contracts and showed really very, very uh, success, big success, and basically incentivizing people with deposit contracts to lose weight over eight months. So that feels like a big success. Okay, we pay people, they can lose weight. But the bad news was that they didn't keep the weight off. And this is a story that's been repeated in in many studies, I'm just choosing one as an example by some of our, our good friends. One of the things, though, about this and the fact that this is not typically sustained um, is that part of what I, I my readers will wonder if I'm saying this correctly, I'm correct me if I get this wrong, is that one of the big challenges with weight loss is the gaining back, but when if people never gained it in the first place, we don't have that challenge where the body is essentially fighting back. And so we think targeting kids is a really, really promising place to do this, because weight loss is such a big issue, but with adults, you're trying to get them to lose it with kids, you're just trying to prevent them from gaining it, and that's actually a much easier problem. So we're very, very excited. Uh, that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to turn it over to Angela. Subject, I just want to say, look for the RFP. This is probably post-medication adherence, the next thing we'll be focusing on, and really excited to get you guys involved. While well, my slides up, can you just say a little bit more about what the deposit contractor intervention was? I should ask Kevin to do it, actually. I feel ridiculous doing that. I'm going to give Kevin the mic so he can describe it properly and fully. We wanted to have very high rates of participation, so we gave people the opportunity to put down between a penny a day and $3 a day uh, per month, and then each month they could re-up. And this was in a population of, of veterans who were relatively low income, and we, we matched the deposits one-to-one. -one. So we actually had really high participation rates and the, uh, this, this had followed another study where we initially had shown a, a four-month weight loss and uh, tested deposit contracts and lotteries, but we were trying to see if we could extend it to eight months, but as Katie highlighted, it's really hard to maintain weight loss, uh, particularly when you turn off incentives, and if we can prevent weight gain, that probably would be a, a better way to go. I didn't take any questions, I realized. Uh, well, I'll do it after any questions. <laughs> okay, Katie and I will take questions afterwards. Um, okay, third and final opportunity on the horizon for BCFG. Um, MTurk, how many of you have ever done a study on MTurk? Raise your hand. Uh, MTurk is fast. Uh, you know, we can complain about how much we have to, oh, say what? Oh, yeah, this is like the placebo effect, Mike. Except for we're so much better when you turn it on, Katie. Okay, okay, so uh, so many of us have done studies on MTurk, and MTurk we can complain about how much it costs, and we can complain about the representation of the data, but it's pretty fast and it's pretty frictionless. Um, now, if you contrast doing studies on MTurk with doing work on kids in schools where there are federal legislation, you know, guidelines, there are state, there are district, and it's just, you know, firewalls from schools, PTAs, school boards, it's the opposite of being fast and frictionless. And I dragged a Sean up here with me because uh, I have a nonprofit that Sean and I run. It's called Character Lab. It's not part of Penn, it's an independent 501c3. And its ambition is to make research on kids as fast and as frictionless as it is to do research on mentor. And so um, Sean, not me, is actually going to take you through Research Lab. I mean, no, Character Lab. It says Character Lab, Research Lab. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Angela. Um, so I just heard about presenting this a couple minutes ago, um, literally <laughs> just now. But uh, thankfully, I've given a version of this before. So excited to be up in front of all of you talking about Character Lab Research Network. So Character Lab Research Network really just does three things. We partner with schools. We have this really deep legal infrastructure where we have compliance with IRB and with FERPA and with 
all the things that need to be done for parental consent and all that stuff that makes things hard legally. And then we have this digital platform. We partnered with Qualtrics. Their CEO is on our advisory board, and they've helped build some technology that can help integrate with student information system data, help clean that data, de-identify that data, make that easier for researchers. Um, and so these, actually the way we built these pillars of Character Lab Research Network was based on um, when we were giving out grants to researchers in the past to encourage more work in the area of school-based research. And what we found was we were giving out $300,000 to to great researchers, some of which are in the room, and they were coming back and saying, hey, you know, the school partner that we had, they turned over, the school leader doesn't work there anymore. Hey, the uh, IRB, they, they didn't let us do opt out consent, so now it's opt-in consent, and our sample size, which was supposed to be 300, is now like 12. Um, and so all of those issues led to us kind of doing some design thinking and thinking about how we can remove the barriers, and um, that's how we came up with Research Network. I think character development is so important because if you learn about these character skills while also learning about your academics in school, I think that the combination of the two really complement each other. Sea Learn connects world-class scientists across the world with schools across the country. Our job is to make it easier for our school partners and our researchers. We try to make this work fast and fresh on us. Character Lab made it pretty seamless. They integrated it into what our school district already does. It was easy. By students participating in character development research, just 30 minutes can help students globally. We know so little about how kids grow up. We know so little about the psychology of mistake making. What C Learn does is accelerate the rate to which we learn about these strategies so that we can help all students throughout. For students like me, who came from backgrounds where I wasn't really able to have access to these opportunities, it really opens the door. It might just take a 30 minute module to, to just think about starting a conversation with your teacher that you didn't think about starting before. And now that teacher becomes your mentor. And now that mentor starts to have a far greater impact on your life than you would have ever thought. I think the kids feel somewhat important about this, that they're, they're involved in the process. They were proud, they felt special. One of them even told Emily, nobody ever asks us these things. We really want to bring the student and the teacher voice into this research process. And we need to make sure that we're matching the right researchers and the right research with your school. A lot of times research is very theoretical. Yes, if we could cherry pick our students and design our school and had a budget that was unlimited, then we could probably make those theories work. But Character Lab, coming in, meeting with the students, seeing what the school is, what the day-to-day -day is, and tailoring their research to our need benefits us as well as them. You might all really love grit, but that might not be what your students need. I think we're going to increase the level of psychological wisdom that there is in, in teachers and administrators and parents. You will receive preliminary results and publication. You will see what works, and we're also gonna share with you what doesn't work because we think that's just as important. You are here because you and your school have said that you want to contribute to the science. You want to be on the cutting edge. The purpose is not necessarily to implement a program, which you see a lot. What we're doing right now is really just looking at basic research. So we're on the cutting edge, we're on the front end of what this research is, and building something that's going to be good for schools, but more so importantly, good for students. Great, so we wanna take it from what was, what's been a thousand students a year um, that have been a part of a, uh, a randomized control trial in schools on something related to motivation or, or character and we wanna change that next year. Our, our goal is to put 100,000 students across 100 schools through um, various uh, randomized control trials um, on these areas that are of interest to all of us. So um, I'm going to be um, pretty short here and just say here are some of the boundaries and constraints of um, what we can do on, on Research Network right now, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we can't do. But essentially, we focus on middle school and high schools on the network. Right now, we have about next year, we're aiming to have 85 to 100 schools on the network. Um, we, one thing to mention, per the conversation that's happened earlier, we are really interested in, um, in figuring out all these um, important parts of the context of these schools and really matching those schools 
context and being able to surface that up with appropriate research projects. And so we've been piloting out a lot of different ways of how to do piloting more effectively. So how do we, um, we have a new internship program with students from each school that are student ambassadors that you can jump on a video call with anytime. We've got small classroom pilots that we're working on um, doing more often. So lots of different um, things going on there. We have texting, targeted interventions. We're working with some, um, some experts that helped with the National Mindset Study that can help us create stratified uh, buckets of schools and clusters of schools based on certain uh, demographics um, that we can target interventions towards. Um, obviously, we've got a lot of school records. We can facilitate longitudinal studies, correlational surveys, and performance tasks. Here's what we can't do. Interventions targeting teachers, parents, or peers. Uh, facilitate school visits for all kinds of FERPA and legal um, reasons. Um, incentives, we're not there yet. I know that's hard for this room, but we'll get there soon. Uh, and more than three doses. So as you saw in the video, three times a year, 30 minutes each time. That's when all of our schools and the networks sit down their students and do these activities. That's at the start of the year for these like fresh start effects. Also when we get back from the uh, holiday break and then at the end of the year. Um, in between that, there are some, um, there are some opportunities to do texting. Um, our text responses have been notoriously low, um, probably because of lack of incentives. Um, but probably for some other reasons as well that we're also still trying to figure out. Um, and then studies about studies about uh, sex, drugs, or rock and roll. So uh, things about you know religion and you know um, all kinds of certain sensitive questions that FERPA doesn't allow us to ask without parental consent. So I'll stop there and open up for a kind of Q and A and just say that we're excited to invite all of you guys to be a part of the research network. We um, are. Um, thinking about how we can form a sustainable model of uh, financially in the future where we can charge some rate that would be a lot less than um, anybody trying to run studies on, on MTurk even. Um, but until then, um, we've got some philanthropic support to invite uh, you guys to run projects. And so we'll be in touch within the next couple of weeks with more details on, on how to do that. Thank you. You mean this is typically something uh, three periods in a class? So and these schools, when they, when they assign the behavior opinions, say that they uh, commit to sitting their kids down three times during the year, at the beginning of the year, just after the winter break, and then in the late spring. So it's basically, if you think about a, an intervention, you want to do a mental contrasting and implementations in that general, then you think, like, the parameter is that, like, I only really have three touch points maximum three class periods, and then testing. By the way, teenagers also don't like it when people text them More who they don't know. <laughs> you know. Like they turn out, they, they're, yeah, they don't like it. But, but you, you do have testing. So those are the four instances. Neither do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then what's being randomized is at the, at the individual level or at the class level? You can randomize at the, at the classroom level, um, you know, there's a power issue there, but so so you can you can in theory randomize at the classroom level, but or the school the student level, and, and in the student level of course right. So the, the the sort of default would be that we're randomizing at the student level, right? So kids will walk walk into the computer lab and just like the study that Lauren had done as part of the you know tournament of five, kids walked into the computer lab and there were twelve different treatment arms. And they all sat down at computers and then just like Baltrics randomized them. They had uh, earbuds on, and then they, you know, it's, you know, they can't really see each other's screens. So that's typically, I think, what was because of the power issue. Because then, if you ask us for like, you know, half of our schools, so that we can do twenty schools, what the people are going to say no. But in theory, we can, you know, begin to build a model where we can randomize it like larger levels. And right now, we can even do classroom level. Uh, how much range is there across the hundred schools? And is that, I mean, is that something you're working on? Socioeconomically, yeah, basically, it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, um, we're working on creating these like different stratified buckets right now. But right now, we're all over the country, and it's definitely a pretty diverse population. It's uh, about double the national average when it comes to uh, Black, Latinx, and socioeconomic status. Low socioeconomic status. Do you think that um, behavior change, for example, do any get out Where's Todd? Todd John? Yeah. Todd 
much else. Um, probably we won't, but Todd, who is one of us, has a wonderful NGO uh, in DC called the Analyst Institute that will. And if you're interested in doing the, if you're interested in doing that work, the Behavior Change Network of Scientists, we can get you in the right in contact with it. So um, let me, um, thank you, Dolly, for asking that question. Let me say that there's something that's different about this character lab research network opportunity than anything else, which is that this really is more like mTOR. You um, can, for example, create your own outcome variable and just run a study that's like a self-contained experiment or your outcome variable you collect in your session. Um, you might work on different outcome variables, so Max might want to increase attendance and, you know, Phil might want to increase GPA or somebody else might want to decrease, um, you know, bullying or there, there's heterogeneity is welcome. And I think unlike these other opportunities, we're not going to run them necessarily all at the same time. So really, you just get like the um, easy pass onto this network, which is funded by Chen Zuckerberg Initiative and, and other philanthropists, so that, you know, we had a very limited supply, um, so we decided to make the supply available to certain scientists, and by virtue of being in DCFG, you are the scientists, as well as there are a couple of other networks. Can I add, yeah. With the mental model of, um, okay. Yeah. They collect amazing school data that you could get, so you don't have to create your own outcome variable. What do you have, like 100 outcome variables that are objectively measured at the school level? from GPA to attendance to disciplinary infractions? Yeah. Well, yeah, schools collect grades. They collect standardized test scores. They collect attendance. Um, they do collect behavioral things like delinquency, but then they collect them all in their own special way. Um, there aren't that many outcomes um, in, in, the, in that sense. Uh, but, you know, you could create your own outcome variable. So I'm just saying like, you know, people want to run an experiment that's not as longitudinal with the, you know, the same qualities of it. Yeah, and uh, to add to that, we also have been creating a suite of performance tasks that we're going to make available to the researchers on the network as well that can help measure some of these short-term things. So something like frustration tolerance and uh, persistence and um, academic diligence and some of these validated measures that we can, we've integrated with Qualtrics to make it really easy to plug and play with some of the interventions you guys work on. 